Legislature's webinar, EPA Greenhouse Gas Emissions Regulations, State Options and Responses. Today's webinar is um, hosted by the NCSL Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee and is the first of our uh, group's 2015 spring webinar series. Uh, for a complete schedule and registration information for the other webinars in this series, please visit our website at www.ncsl.org. Uh, my name is Glenn Anderson. I am the Energy Program Director here at NCSL and will be moderating today's webinar, which is basically providing an overview of uh, what states are doing uh, in response to the U.S. EPA's proposed climate regulations. Uh, there's obviously quite a bit of discussion um, and uh, likely a requirement of quite a heavy lift as well uh, by state policymakers across the U.S. Um, in addition to many other agencies within states uh, to meet these requirements. Um, we uh, at NTSL have been tracking uh, legislative uh, activities and have produced a, um, a number of documents summarizing uh, the latest actions uh, in 2015 and 2014 as well, which, is, which uh, these publications are available on our website. So we welcome you to access that as well and, and to look at our um, legislative tracking database, which also includes up-to-date information on uh, those actions. So before uh, I begin, I wanted to mention that the webinar is being recorded and that uh, registrants will have access to the recording and, uh, of the webinar as well as the presentation slides on our website. And we'll be sending a notice out uh, shortly after uh, the conclusion of this uh, webinar with a link to these resources. So our speakers today are Alex Dunn from the Environmental Council of the States and John Lyons of the Kentucky Energy and Environment Cabinet. Presenters will be answering questions after each presentation, so feel free to type your questions in the question box on the right side of your screen at any time during the webinar. Um, so I will just, uh, we will proceed with Alex as our first speaker. We're very fortunate to have her uh, to present. Uh, she is the Executive Director and General Counsel of ECOS. And which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan association of state and territorial environmental commissioners. As executive director, Ms. Dunn works on legislation, policy, and regulatory matters affecting air, wa waste, water, and toxics. She's a published author and speaks regularly on diverse environmental topics. In prior positions, Ms. Dunn served as executive director and general counsel of the Association of Clean Water Administrators and as general counsel of the National Association of Clean Water Agencies. So let's welcome Alex. Great. Well, um, good afternoon or good morning to you all from whatever part of the country you're in. It's a real pleasure. Thank you, Glenn, for that great introduction. And um, really uh, delighted to be uh, presenting uh, with such a, a great um, group of people. It was a lot of fun to prepare for this presentation because if there's one topic that is getting so much conversation and discussion in D.C. and around the country, it is the 111D proposal. So my goal today is to give you a brief overview of what it is uh, and then give you some of the, the key issues that states are um, looking at from a very big picture around the country. And, um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll turn it over to hear how one specific state is, um, is managing this issue. And um, I think that the big picture plus the specific application will give you all um, a really good sense of, of how we're moving forward across the country on this. So again, um, let's turn to the, the next slide and uh, give you a brief overview. So under the Clean Air Act, Section 111D, um, it's, a, it's a unique provision of the statute that has only been used a handful of times up until now. 
It allows each state, and so I'm going to emphasize state, uh, with help from EPA to develop uh, performance standards for stationary sources um, to reduce pollutants. And what's interesting about 111B is it allows the state to achieve those reductions through a plan that the state writes and the plan allows the state to choose something that's called BSER or best system of emission reduction with a consideration of cost. So it's a broader standard than you might see in other parts of the Clean Air Act. And if you read this all by itself, it would seem like it gives states a whole lot of flexibility. And in that regard, it does. However, here's the trick. EPA has established a goal for each state to reduce carbon emissions under 111D. And the agency has made assumptions about each state's ability to reduce its carbon emissions. And so because of that, um, there's more stringency perhaps embedded in the proposed rule than uh, one might um, realize at first blush. Um, so let's turn to the next slide. This uh, map shows you the uh, carbon or CO2 reduction targets proposed, I want to emphasize proposed, for each state in the country under the proposed rule from EPA. I'm going to talk about timing in a minute so you'll get a sense of where we are. Um, but you will see a wide range of reductions. Uh, with Vermont at zero and Washington State at a 72% reduction, representing the two extremes, a variety of states in that kind of navy blue 41 to 60% reduction category, a whole lot of the country in kind of the turquoise 21 to 40%. And then states like you'll hear from today in Kentucky in the 1 to 20 percent. But don't be fooled, as you'll hear from Kentucky, uh, even a reduction in the 18 percent category for a state might be extremely challenging based on the assumptions the agency made about the state's current energy portfolio. Next slide, please. So in the proposed rule, EPA suggested that how would a state um, reach these percent reductions that you saw on the prior slide? And what the agency suggested was that states might want to think about organizing the plan that they write under 111D. And again, it's a plan that the state will write and submit to EPA. That they might want to organize their plan around four building blocks. But I want to be clear that EPA did not limit states to only the four building blocks. And so you'll hear a lot of talk about the building blocks, but you may also hear about alternatives to the building blocks. A lot of um, people discussing this rule right now are feeling like they're constrained by the building blocks. So let me walk you through them. The first one is taking the existing fossil fuel or coal-fired power plants and making them more efficient. Certain, uh, the, the assumption that the agencies made is that nationally existing generating units are called EGUs. Um, existing plants can be 6% more efficient, so they can reduce their CO2 emissions uh, by another 6%. What we hear from utilities is that due to 
prior regulations by EPA and due to other efficiencies that they've already put in place, that 6% is not achievable for many facilities and that we're looking more at probably 3% in terms of being able to make those existing plants more efficient. Okay, so again, you're trying to achieve that big number that you saw on the prior slide. So maybe you get three or 4% from building block one. The next building block is let's bring on some more fuel, uh, more, um, or less carbon dependent fuel sources. So this would involve, as you see in the middle column of two, switching to natural gas. Now, there's lots of pros for natural gas. It is non-carbon, uh, uh, but it doesn't just come on with a flick of a switch. You have to have natural gas infrastructure to make it happen. And when I get to timing, you might wonder if we can, as a country, bring on the natural gas infrastructure fast enough to make building block two as effective as it could be. But let's say you get another chunk of reduction towards that total percentage from building block two, then we go to building block three. You're still not there yet. Building block three says, okay, now bring on your renewables. Let's bring in uh, nuclear. Let's bring on carbon capture and sequestration. Let's bring on wind. Let's bring on solar. The proposal does not deal too well with hydropower, but I think the final rule will. Once again, the question will be, how quickly and how reliable will these nuclear and uh, renewable sources be? The rule, the proposal, assumes that all existing nuclear capacity in the United States will stay online. And it also assumes that all new nuclear that's projected to be built will be built and come online. And anyone who's worked on nuclear issues knows that nuclear power plants can be extremely controversial in communities and may not come online as quickly as anticipated. Also, we know that a lot of existing plants that are at the end of their 40-year licenses have been given 20-year extensions in some cases. But at that point, those facilities will be 60 years old. And will the public accept further extension of the life of those facilities? But that is an assumption of the proposal. The last building block is called demand side reduction. If we could just, as a society, reduce our demand for energy, we will reduce our carbon release. So what we're going to do here is try and promote efficiency in uh, businesses, in homes, all kinds of programs in states that could improve the transmission and use and demand for energy. Well, so let's go to the next slide. I'm going to breeze through this one. It's more of a resource for you to show why are we focusing on uh, power plants. Power plants are documented to be the largest source of carbon pollution in the United States today, accounting for a third of the domestic GHG emissions. So if you look at this chart from EPA, there are other sources of CO2, but the, uh, the power sector is uh, the big one. That's why this rule is focused on that sector. Next slide. Let's talk about timing. So what you've heard is pretty ambitious. We're talking about changing state energy portfolios, switching from coal to natural gas, bringing on renewables, reducing consumer and business demand for energy. Those are some big transformational changes. And what the goal is under the proposed rule is that we will achieve a nationwide reduction of 30% from 2005 levels by 2030. Now in the comments received, a lot of people are questioning why 2005 levels? Should we be looking at a different number? And you know, although I don't hear too many questions about 2030, there are some other questions about timing. 
this slide shows you the proposal came out last June. The comments went through December. Over 3 million comments that the agency is working their way through with the intent to finalize the rule this summer. I would anticipate late July, early August. Then states will have one year approximately to submit a plan. That's a whole lot of work that states are gonna have to do between the summer of 15 and the summer of 16. What if the state needs more time? It is possible to get an additional year. And if a state plans to work with another state, perhaps they want to take a bubble approach or a trading approach the way you see in the Northeast with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, then a possible two-year extension would be available. And this is all under the proposal. We'll see in the final if there are some adjustments. There's also something that's not on this slide called the 2020 cliff. Some of the reductions have to be achieved in kind of a front-loaded way by 2020. And states have generally co complained in their comments that the 2020 early reductions that are proposed are not achievable. There is a lot of sense that EPA will remove the 2020 uh, pre-deadline and perhaps ask for some sort of iterative reporting between the present time or the final rule and 2030, but perhaps not push for so hard for upfront reductions by 2020. So if you hear people talk about the 2020 cliff, that's what's in the proposal right now, early upfront reductions. Next slide, please. All right, so here we are. As state legislatures and state legislators and staff, you may feel like you're between a rock and a hard place. This is a big ask and states are gonna have to move very quickly. And we're talking about things that are complicated. So next slide, how are we gonna get you, how are you gonna get out from between that rock and hard place? Well, it's not gonna be all that easy. We've gotta talk politics. Um, when you look at this proposal as a state legislature, recognize that this is viewed as the most significant element of the current administration's climate legacy. There are some quotes here that I won't read to you, you can read yourself, where the president has been widely promoting the United States will make meaningful carbon reductions. The administrator of EPA is undaunted in moving forward with this proposal. You all may know that in November and early December, the US will go to Paris for the Conference of the Parties of the United Nations uh, Council on Climate Change. And they want to bring forward the fact that all 50 states are moving forward. This also applies to tribes, I should say, in a different way, as well as territories, but I'm not gonna talk in detail about tribes and territories today. If you do have them in your state, there's some separate uh, provisions and proposals that you can look at on the EPA website regarding tribes and territories. We've got the Congress here, very concerned. Oversight hearings have been held and questions about whether this is appropriate. At the state level, there is so much diversity, both among states and within the same state. Typically on an environmental regulation, the only commenter is the state environmental agency. On this rulemaking, you might have seen comments, and if you look on the Bipartisan Policy Center map, which is one of the resources I'll give you at the end of the, my slide, you'll see that in some states, six or seven different sets of comments were filed by the energy sector, by the energy regulators, the PUC, by the attorney general, by the governors, and by the environmental agency, making this whole proposal extremely unique. And now I'd like to turn to a couple of slides showing you from the host of this webinar, NCSL, um, just how many state legislatures have taken action in some way on these specific regulations. And at the beginning of the webinar, I believe Glenn gave you this um, uh, resource, which is publicly available pretty amazing here where you see the number of states that have enacted, introduced, or done some combination of legislation. Next slide. Here are resolutions that you've seen uh, in many, many states. 
and one more picture. So if you look at this, and I've looked at it several times, one wonders, do we have something that is okay? Do we have something legal or do we have something illegal? Do we have something that's doable or do we have something that's completely unachievable? If you look back at those maps and at the different comments filed, you would really think it is like this slide. You see three, you see four, both people are right and they can't possibly both be right. Next slide. Since we just had tax day, I throw this one in to give you a chuckle. But when it comes to the Clean Air Act, there are a lot of smart people on both sides of the desk saying, I'm right, my interpretation is correct. This is illegal. This is beyond EPA's authority. And then someone else sitting on the other side saying, this is unquestionably within EPA's authority. This is exactly the right thing to do. And in fact, it doesn't go far enough. Next slide. So unfortunately or fortunately, this is coming down in part to the lawyers. Lawyers have been sketching out various legal arguments for and against this particular rulemaking. One of the arguments that's been made is that EPA cannot regulate these existing generating units because they are already regulated under Clean Air Act 112. And parts of the Clean Air Act say that if they're already regulated, you can't sort of have two bites at the apple. That's one of the legal arguments that's being made. Another argument is that EPA does not have the authority to go beyond building block one, or what's called outside the fence line of the facility. Remember that building block one was improving uh, emissions uh, burn rates at existing facilities, but all the other um, building blocks had things to do with renewables and natural gas and efficiency programs. And those don't have to do with the electric generating unit or things happening within the facility. So people are saying, that it's illegal because EPA cannot regulate anything but the electric generating unit itself. Others are saying that the standard itself would be unachievable. There are constitutional challenges that have been made and are being prepared. That this is uh, beyond EPA's authority, that it is over, overtaking state authority under the 10th Amendment. It's an impermissible intrusion of the federal government into state decision making. And some are saying that there's a process issue, that utilities have invested in all of this infrastructure and this rule essentially would force them to shut down and take the property of the utility. There have already been a couple of cases that have worked their way through the courts. One in Nebraska was found that it challenged the rule, but it's premature. We can't tell yet whether um, this rule is going to have an um, adverse effect. Uh, the court held that the state of Nebraska had, quote, jumped the gun. And um, so that case was, was non-dispositive. Uh, Murray Energy um, is going on in the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit. Um, they are trying to get review of the proposed rule, arguing that the preamble is final action, arguing that EPA lacks the authority under 111D because of the regulation under 112. This case uh, still moving forward. Next slide. So EPA is bringing forward something innovative. There's a lot of concern about it. Can they do it? That's the question. Next slide. If you ask EPA, they're gonna say, yes, we can. Here's why. We are required to and allowed to regulate greenhouse gases. We 
um, have an actual legislative conflict, which you legislators will appreciate. There were two versions of the Clean Air Act that were passed, and they actually conflict with one another. And so when we try to resolve that conflict, we're going to resolve it in favor of the ability to regulate sources under 111D. We're also going to say, EPA will say, that there's nothing that prohibits us from going outside the fence. The concept of BSER that I talked about means you can take a broader perspective. And we've done it before. We've looked at entire systems of energy and systems of combustion and other rulemakings. We've done this before. And flexibility. Hey, this isn't binding you, states. This isn't taking away anybody's opportunities. In fact, this is a very flexible opportunity for states to write any plan, any plan that will get there. Next slide. So, will EPA win these challenges? I don't have any money riding on this prediction, but I will say briefly in the interest of time that this slide documents to you that EPA, although in the past has been on some losing streaks, is kind of on a winning streak right now when it comes to uh, its authority under the Clean Air Act. Very recently, their mercury air toxics rule has been held up. April 2014, the CASPER rule has been held up. The Supreme Court has already clarified in Mass the EPA in 2007 that greenhouse gases are air pollutants. In 2011, that EPA must rein in carbon pollution, that it is uh, endangering human health. And in 2014, basically, Massive amounts of 100 lawsuits all rounded up together left EPA uh, with reaffirmed authority to work on greenhouse gas regulations with only one piece of a regulation uh, that only applied to 3% of sources being uh, tossed out by the U.S. Supreme Court. So you can imagine that right now EPA might be feeling fairly emboldened with their history, particularly with the three Supreme Court cases here. Next slide. So some of the legislation and, and uh, resolutions on the map that I showed you earlier are the just say no approach. Don't do a plan. A Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has said, don't do a plan, stand up, States, don't do it. This is illegal. Just sit on your hands. And um, at least the governor of Oklahoma just this week uh, signed an executive order stating that the state was unlikely to do a plan. Um, what happens if a state doesn't do a plan? Under the Clean Air Act, the state will be what's called FIP. F-I-P, let's make it a verb. That means that the federal government will come in and do the work for you. Uh, EPA does plan to release a draft federal implementation plan this summer. And the questions are, once we see that FIP, will we like it as states? Will, it, will EPA be the right entity to regulate the sources in my state? Will EPA understand the different economic factors the, the, the workforce in my state? Will they understand my state's ability to switch and bring on renewables or to work with my bordering states? Uh, do I want to have EPA write this plan or am I better off as a state doing it myself? Next slide. I'm gonna try and wrap up so there's enough time for John here. Um, by saying that we've got some questions about enforceability. Say a state does a plan. They can um, take option one, just focus on those affected electric generating units. But the problem is those existing units won't be able to get there all by themselves. 
so they could take the portfolio approach, the building block approach, and bring in a variety of other commitments. Uh, bottom line is there are ways that states could approach a plan, but the state somehow would have to say, yes, we can do it. And the question is, if the state says, yes, we can do it, how are they going to get all those reductions from sources that they may not be able to directly regulate, like an energy efficiency program? Next slide. This is just to show you what we're probably going to get, a whole bunch of different plans that look completely different from state to state. And the last thing I want to talk to you all about on the next slide, and my last substantive slide, is what about some of those states working together? The rule does set up the concept, the proposal, of states working across state lines. We have, in the Clean Air Act and with air pollutants, worked across state lines before. And we have states right now that are working across state lines in the Northeast. If a state wants to try and work across state lines, this is a time to do it. But do, does the coordination and does the timing of this rule really support multi-state approaches? They may work. They may be very more cost effective. But again, we're looking at a very aggressive timeline. What I've heard from states is if you don't already have the skids well greased to work with your neighbors, it's unlikely and risky to rely on a multi-state approach. So a lot of states may be going solo at this point. Next slide. I leave you with this. You can't put your head in the sand on this rule. It will be coming out in final. It is unlikely that it will be stopped by Congress. It is unlikely that we could have a presidential uh, override, a uh, congressional override of a presidential veto. So that ostrich is actually not just putting his head in the sand. He actually, or she, is turning her eggs. So while she appears to be doing nothing, she's actually doing something productive. So what I say is, you may be appearing to put your head in the sand, but while you're doing that, try to do something productive at the same time. Start building those relationships. Start talking about what kind of control you want to have in your state. And with that, my last slide is one you can look at later with some really good resources, and I'm going to turn it over to John. Actually, this is, uh, this is Glenn. I just wanted uh, to pose a few questions. We had a few come in and uh, before we uh, move on to John. And um, one of them, in, and I'm not sure that you, uh, Alex, will be able to answer this, but it, it surrounds the science that supports the EPA action and does the EPA have um, kind of scientists on there, uh, you know, within EPA and ha ha do they have the science that supports this activity um, as in order to prevent harm uh, from these emissions? Well, they have a lot of science that, that backs up their work um, on uh, greenhouse gases. So uh, the simple answer is yes. Um, science uh, is often in the eye of the beholder. So um, do they have the science to specifically back up their, um, this specific proposal? I think, again, you know, generally to show that greenhouse gases are a problem, that was established in mass the EPA with sea level rise. There's science out there. Where I think um, there's good questions about science is the science and assumptions that were used to look at the state um, reduction targets. That might be an area to, to take a look. Okay, great. And then another question uh, relates to um, those things that are out, you know, the outside defense uh, actions and um, how EPA might look at things like uh, forest sequestration or land practices that reduce um, emissions, but are definitely you know not specifically related to the uh, power sector. Right. So it, so that's something that a state could include in their plan and say you know we you know we have 18% uh, reduction. We're going to achieve. 3% uh, of it through these um, forest se sequestration activities and through land conservation practices. And again, that gets back to my slide on enforceability. 
there are questions about how a state um, would over time have to um, hold various sources accountable for um, helping them reach their ultimate goal. Um, that may be um, a tricky area. And, and I, I wonder if maybe John will reflect a little bit on that in, in, in one particular state's case. Uh, because the, at the end of the day, if this is set up the way we anticipate it to be set up, states have to meet those targets. And it's not quite clear what will happen if you don't. Um, but, but there's a real fear about the risk of not meeting it. Well, great, thanks. And, uh, and perhaps John will be able to uh, share some of his thoughts on this uh, issue as well. So I uh, will welcome our next speaker, uh, John Lyons, who is Kentucky's Cabinet Assistant Secretary of Climate Policy. Uh, Mr. Lyons has served in various capacities for the Energy and Environment Cabinet during his 26 years in public service. In 2013, uh, Mr. Lyons was appointed as the Cabinet's first Assistant Secretary for Climate Policy to tackle the complex world of air quality regulations and their impact on energy and climate issues. Prior to this, he served as director of the Kentucky Division for Air Quality for nearly 12 years. John has made numerous presentations on a variety of air quality environmental issues and has helped shape the regulatory landscape on air quality and energy policy. And um, oh, I just wanted to mention before uh, John begins, uh, if you do have questions during during his presentation or at any time, please enter those in the question box on the right-hand side of your screen, screen, and we will get to those after uh, John's presentation. So without further delay, let's welcome John. Uh, let me, uh, Glenn, can you hear me? Let's make sure since I've been on mute. Yeah, no, it sounds great. Thanks. Right, great. Uh, thank you, Glenn, and uh, also I want to thank the NCSL for this opportunity to present uh, a Kentucky perspective on this very important issue. Uh, you know, Alex gave a great overview of the rule, uh, a lot of the litigation and, and many of the conversations that are surrounding uh, this proposed rule, and I, I've said this many times, I, it's not an overstatement to say this is the most controversial, complex, uh, emotional, and politicized rulemaking that I have ever dealt with in the 26 years that I've been in this cabinet. Uh, it by far exceeds that. Uh, you know, I, from a domestic issue standpoint, I put it on par with with uh, healthcare and, and immigration. It, it is that that big in my eyes. Uh, some may not uh, agree with that, but uh, it's certainly up there, and it's not a stretch to say it's that important uh, to the American people and to the economy and to uh, the energy policy in this country. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Uh, first off, I just want to give you a little bit of perspective of what Kentucky's like and what we deal with here. Uh, the Energy Environment Cabinet includes uh, three main departments being environmental protection, our, our energy department, as well as natural resources. And we also have the Public Service Commission uh, administratively attached to the cabinet. Uh, the reason I bring this up uh, and its importance is we're one of four states at this point in time that are organized. Uh, they're structurally organized like this, and I believe it gives us a great deal of advantage over many states in being able to discuss these issues because air quality, and it has been this way for a long time, is inextricably connected to energy policy. We've, we've actually been dealing with this for many years through the uh, ozone and particulate matter transport issues uh, that we've been dealing with, and we've worked with our PSC uh, for several years now and trying to help them understand uh, the air quality rules and what the utilities bring to them in rate cases in terms of uh, getting uh, uh, environmental surcharges back. Uh, so we've been working them for a long time. Um, our utilities are vertically integrated. The importance of that is from the standpoint of uh, not stranding assets. That is, the investments made due to other rules in the past, whether that's transport or the mercury and toxics rules, uh, were uh, you know millions and millions of dollars in controls. Actually, in this state, it's, it's about 4.5 billion at this point for mercury and toxics alone. That those controls and those assets don't get stranded due to this new rule, i.e., causes plant shutdowns and the ratepayer gets 
uh, gets uh, uh, penalized twice uh, for the original controls and then has to continue to pay for those controls if a plant shuts down. Uh, you know, all our utilities, the majority of them, are regulated by the PSC. Uh, we have the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, in the western part of the state that is not, as well as a couple of municipals, but by and large, most of our utilities are regulated. And we also have a service territory that's probably pretty unique uh, among all the states. Uh, we have uh, PJM territory as well as MISO. Uh, Tennessee Valley Authority obviously runs their own uh, dispatch territory. And our largest utility in the state, uh, to the tune of about eight uh, gigawatts of generation, are independent and serve mostly a, a, a native load here in the state. So it's a challenge for us to even discuss multi-state collaborative uh, uh, type of discussions uh, when we have uh, a makeup like that uh, and we have territory and, and all those four entities. Next slide, please. Uh, Kentucky, as you've probably heard many times, uh, is heavily coal-fired generation, actually 93% in 2014. It's been that way for many years. 50% um, of our generation goes to heavy manufacturing, uh, and that's why we have uh, the generation and the low electricity rates that we have is due to our coal-fired generation. Uh, our average age of our coal-fired fleet is 43 years old. Um, amongst coal-fired generation, that's probably on par with a lot of states, but the point is it's an aged fleet and you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, useful years left in a lot of those plants. And we saw that uh, with the mercury and air toxics rule implementation that resulted in this state, uh, or will result in this state, shutting down 16 coal-fired boilers, equaling uh, nearly uh, 5,000 megawatts but more importantly, reducing 21 million tons of CO2, real tons reduction. Uh, that's nearly 22 or about that's 22 and a half percent of what EPA calculated our uh, emissions to be in 2012 with the baseline of, of the 111D rule. So we, we're, going to have, we're going to have significant reductions due to that rule alone. Um, unlike a lot of other states, we don't have any combined uh, cycle natural gas. Our first plant is coming online this summer. Uh, it's the one, uh, this technology is, is what EPA is looking to in terms of uh, reducing emissions and, and switching uh, traditional coal-fired or other fossil fuel generation to uh, natural gas combined cycle uh, that Alex explained in her building block uh, slide. Um, that's uh, a natural gas combined cycle does about, has about half the carbon output that a coal-fired unit has, and, and but traditionally we've had coal-fired generation, so there's been no NGCC in this state. We do have about 50 simple cycle peaking units, um, but those are only for uh, you know demand issues, uh, mostly in the summer. Uh, we're the third most electricity intensive state, measured in kilowatt hours used to produce one dollar state GDP, uh, and that's due to uh, the fact that we're Again, heavy industry, we're the, we're the third leading auto, auto manufacturing state. Uh, we produce 40% of the nation's aluminum and 30% of the steel, again, associated with those other heavy industries. And uh, we're very electricity intensive uh, here and have been for many, many years. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm not going to belabor these points too, too much. Alex already kind of went over these, but I bring these facts up because I think there's been a little bit of confusion about what EPA's authorities are in terms of regulating greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act. Uh, Alex has already explained that EPA definitely has the authority to regulate greenhouse gases uh, under the Clean Air Act due to the Supreme Court ruling in 2007. Uh, but in, a little bit further down in the weeds, uh, EPA must regulate GHGs from electric generating units and other major sources under the new source review uh, program due to the 2010 light duty vehicle standards. Once EPA passed that rule, uh, the Clean Air Act says that you must regulate stationary sources for a regulated pollutant. Uh, with that rule, CO2 became a regulated pollutant, therefore EPA had to regulate for major stationary sources. 
As for 111D, which is the uh, subject of our conversation today, uh, there was a 2010 consent decree with 12 petitioning states and three environmental groups uh, that EPA reached agreement with them that they would regulate um, uh, electric generating units and petroleum refineries for uh, GHGs under the new source, uh, new source performance standards. Uh, next slide, please. And that's what this slide basically depicts, is that, uh, that litigation history there. And over the course of four years uh, from the petition uh, through EPA action to the Obama administration and ultimately the, the consent decree that EPA signed, EPA had to put out this 111D rule. Now, the, the litigation controversy is over how they did it, not whether they have the authority or not to do it, and that's notwithstanding the whole 111, 112 uh, sections of the Clean Air Act that's, uh, that Alex explained. But under this consent decree, EPA had to issue a rule. Now, if this rule is thrown out, that consent decree is still there. And EPA would still have to come back with another 111D rule. So that's why I bring that up, that EPA is still obligated under this consent decree to put out a 111D rule somewhere down the road whether it's this one or another one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let me just briefly mention uh, Kentucky's engagement on the 111D rule. And it all kind of goes back to, to March of 2013 when the NRDC put out uh, their proposal on closing the power plant carbon pollution loophole. Uh, I don't know if uh, most of the audience is familiar with that or not, but essentially, it was a plan to regulate carbon from electric generating units. And once the president's executive order and clean power plan came out, and I was still the air director at the time, we started thinking, well, what would the NRDC proposal do to a state like Kentucky? Well, we click, quickly learned that under the e NRDC plan that it would shut down every coal-fired unit in the state by 2025. And we simply couldn't sit still and be silent uh, while EPA developed a rule perhaps that might be headed in that direction. And that's why we put out a white paper in October of 2013 that was rather controversial in the state uh, from a political standpoint, but the message there was, hey, EPA, if you're going to do this, you need to consider a heavy manufacturing state like Kentucky and the economics that go along with that. You cannot simply do a one-size-fits-all and expect there not to be consequences uh, from an economic standpoint. And that's really what that paper was about. We followed it up with a more in-depth uh, economic analysis of Kentucky's energy future uh, in December of 2013. Both those papers are online, and I would invite you to go look at those. They're still very relevant as it pertains to Kentucky and, and to the overall aspect of energy policy and, and environmental rules as a whole. Uh, and the message, I think, is still still holds true to this day. Uh, of course, our Attorney General joined the Murray uh, Energy Corporation lawsuit that Alex mentioned, as well as joined in July of 2014, uh, several other states' attorneys uh, in another lawsuit, uh, basically on the same issues of that 111 versus 112 um, issue that, uh, that Alex explained. And also, uh, as did most states, if not all states, and many other uh, commenters, we, we submitted our comments in December of 2014 on this rule that uh, voiced our concerns. They were very critical, and we raised a lot of issues in there, particularly the fact that EPA, we don't think EPA has done a very robust economic analysis of the impacts of this rule still to this day. Um, I, I think they try to recognize the difference between states in, in the establishment of the uh, CO2 emission reduction targets, however, uh, it didn't go far enough. Uh, and speaking of that, next slide, please. Uh, in a nutshell, this is basically EPA's target. We go from our baseline on the far right in the red block of 2,166 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. That was based on the 2012 generation and the existing 111D sources at the time. You step down through the building blocks that Alex explained and we ultimately get to our goal of 1763 uh, in 2030, 
which is an 18.6% reduction in the rate uh, of our 111D sources. Uh, Alex said uh, the correct thing in that, you know, that's a heavy lift for us, uh, especially being nearly all coal-fired generation. How are we going to get there? And where is the flexibility for a state like Kentucky, given what uh, EPA has proposed? We don't have an energy efficiency resource standard. We do not have a renewable portfolio standard, um, and essentially we're all coal-fired generation, so that's kind of the landscape of what we've got to deal with. Next slide, please. Uh, to complicate things further, uh, we do have legislation in the state that was passed in the 2014 general session. Uh, we were the first state to pass uh, actual legislation that restricted uh, a state at this state's plan in some form or fashion. Uh, and essentially, it, it doesn't require legislative approval per se, as a lot of the legislation that was floated around this year does, but it does specifically restrict Kentucky's plan if one is submitted to a unit by unit uh, rate based uh, analysis, which is the whole inside the fence uh, concept. It prohibits fuel switching. We cannot. Uh, dictate that a coal-fired unit would switch to natural gas, for instance. It also prohibits coal-firing other fuels with coal, whether that be natural gas or biomass or something else. But the big kicker is trying to get around the hurdle, or over the hurdle, I guess, of prohibiting, uh, limiting the utilization of an electric generating unit. Uh, that could be a very wide interpretation, and anything that you might do in a plan could be con conceivably be interpreted to do that. Uh, that's one we've wrestled with in trying to think about how to go about, uh, you know, making a recommendation uh, down the road. And ultimately, it requires separate coal and natural gas categories, which under the current rule, you really don't have that. Next slide, please. Alex mentioned uh, Senator McConnell's uh, just say no uh, message to the governors and, and others. And uh, again, the Clean Air Act requires state agencies to submit a plan. I think that's been another misnomer in the information that's out there. The Clean Air Act clearly says that a state shall submit a plan uh, upon the final rule or within nine months of the final rule. Uh, the regulations are promulgated under uh, the Clean Air Act also say that states shall submit a plan. And again, Alex explained the repercussions of not doing so in, in that that you will get a federal plan. EPA plans to obviously propose the federal plan along with the final 111D rule uh, this summer. So we'll get a better idea of what that will be and what the repercussions of not submitting a plan will be. But in this state, stakeholders have expressed their desire uh, that there would be a state plan, and that's by and large the utilities, but there are other stakeholders that told us that as well. Uh, they want us controlling it. They don't want a federal plan and, and uh, are fearful of, you know, that will, will be a one-size-fits-all and we won't be able to accommodate the flexibility that we need. And I would just say planning and litigation can occur and will occur simultaneously. Uh, that's happened many times before, and it won't be any different here. Next slide, please. Uh, added complexity for us is we have a governor's race this year. Uh, we'll be transitioning to a new administration in December. Uh, you know, there's several questions. What will the next administration do? How will they handle this issue going forward? Um, how will they resolve the potential conflicts between federal and state law? Uh, there's a lot of other questions that uh, the new administration will have to uh, to address. So what we're doing as administration here is we're preparing a transition document. We're not we're not doing a plan per se, but we're doing analysis and data collection to pass on the next administration. Saying, you know, here's what we saw. Here's what we'd recommend. You know, now the next governor have to decide whether they submit a plan or not. Next uh, slide, please. And just some of the principal considerations wrapping up my presentation to allow a little bit of time for questions is, you know, we're intent on pr protecting our manufacturing economy, uh, maintaining our affordable electricity rates, you know, assuring 
grid reliability to whatever extent that we can do that, and uh, since that's not necessarily a uh, any one state's uh, ability to uh, to do that, we are cognizant of that issue. We want to promote energy diversity. We think that's that hedges against risk in the future. It's a message that we've put forward for many years now. We want to retain our primacy to do our own plan and, of course, maximize you know existing resources and what is still there after the mercury and air toxics rule uh, is implemented. And with that. Uh, Glenn uh, and the audience, I uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Oh, thanks so much, John. That was a very enlightening presentation. And uh, also thanks to Alex. We'd, we'd like to open it up now to uh, general questions for, for both uh, presenters. So again, uh, feel free to type in your questions in the question box at the right-hand side of your screen. I do have a few that have come in, so I, I will ask those. Um, right now, and uh, one of them uh, deals with the mass-based mass versus rate-based and changes in um, generation that might happen due to potentially electric uh, vehicle, uh, electric vehicles, which would obviously increase uh, the use of uh, generation and increase emissions potentially while reducing uh, uh, transportation emissions. Uh, do any of you, either of you have a sense on how that might work into an EPA plan, especially if the state chooses mass-based um, versus the rate-based approach? And maybe you could talk a little bit about what that means, rate versus mass-based. Yeah, uh, Alex, if you don't mind, I'll take a shot first, I guess. Um, rate-based versus mass-based. Uh, Alex explained this a little bit in one of her slides. I mean, the state can take approach where they apply the rate and say the, the state fleet rate will meet the, the target, in our case, 1763. Us being so heavily coal-fired generation, there's no way we can ever meet a 1763 rate. Not when 93% of your generation is operating at 2166. We just can't get there be a rate unless we had a great influx of renewables, nuclear, and or natural gas fire generation, which is not really in the cards necessarily for us. As far as the electric vehicles, first I would say I don't think there's going to be that much penetration to cause uh, of electric vehicles in the, uh, in the mix to cause much generation increase, but it does speak to demand in the future and how do you handle demand going forward. If you're on a rate-based approach, demand is really uninhibited. If you're on a mass-based approach, however, when you're counting tons of CO2, it is important. And where does that demand come from? How do you cover that demand? Well, here in this state, we, we kind of figured that most demand growth would be covered by a 111B source, a new source. And in all uh, honesty, it looks at this point that 111B sources are going to be natural gas-fired units. I think across the nation we've seen utilities uh, move towards natural gas-fired baseload generation, and that's what will cover this new demand. So I, I, ultimately, I don't think it necessarily has to impact a mass-based approach for a state like Kentucky. I can't speak for every state in that respect, but that's kind of a thumbnail sketch of how I would look at that. Right. The only thing I'll, I'll add um, is, you know, there are, EPA did put out some guidance. There was great demand uh, after the proposal came out for uh, a conversion tool. EPA did put out a conversion tool to assist um, in converting those proposed rates to mass. And, and as uh, I alluded to earlier, the, the mass might uh, make it easier for a state to work with another state. Uh, because you can sort of, you're, you're trading or moving tons of CO2 as opposed to trying to line up uh, an emissions rate. Do you think, John, that, the, that um, you know, a, a cap and trade system, you need sort of a mass-based approach? Uh, absolutely. I, I don't know how else it would work. And, and we have history there with the acid rain program and the Knox SIP call in the east where that's the very thing, you have tons of, of the pollutant 
uh, and you ratchet down over time, obviously, to, to get to a, a mass-based approach. And that tool that EPA, uh, that Alex mentioned, it has every state listed in a, in a conversion from the rate that was assigned to a 2030 uh, tons of CO2 that would be allowed. Uh, and it's, it's kind of complicated, but if you dig into it, you can, you can see how they got from point A to point B. So we had another another question actually for for uh, John and possibly for for Alex. Uh, what what uh, the thoughts in Kentucky were uh, regarding uh, carbon capture and sequestration as a potential uh, solution, um, and then also um, considerations on on the um, working in a group with other states okay. from, from Kentucky's viewpoint. Yeah, as we pointed out in our comments on the 111B rule, uh, which heavily relied on CCS to justify the 1,100 pound limit for coal fire generation, uh, we strongly disagreed with EPA's position on CCS uh, on its availability, on its commercial availability. Uh, it's simply not there. And I think we've recently seen a movement towards recognition of that, at least by DOE, when they pulled the plug uh, on future gen. Uh, so we just don't think it's a viable control scenario in the future. Uh, you know, to the extent that you could have um, enhanced oil recovery as the Kemper unit down in Mississippi relies on, yeah, it's viable from that standpoint. Uh, Enhanced oil recovery has been, uh, and CO2 emission, CO2 has been uh, a partner many, many years now, but EOR is not widely available. I mean, we have oil fields in this state, but EOR is rarely used here. Um, and as for a multi-state collaborative, we've gone on record saying we do not think that Kentucky fits very well in any type of multi-state collaborative. Um, given our profile and potentially, you know, our emission reductions, that 21 million tons, it, it really, given the rate that we have, it, it dilutes our rate to join another state that has a higher rate. Uh, it, so, you know, from that standpoint, we're at somewhat an advantage over other states given the rate that we've had, and I think that's been fairly well publicized and, and EPA's been taken to task on that. but. Um, those are two two things that uh, we don't think will work uh, for us. Great, and and there is also a comment here that um, and question. Um, apparently, the um, uh, EPA administrator had hinted to Senator Mikowski yesterday that Alaska uh, may be exempted from 111D regulations, and I'm not sure either of you are aware of that. Um, and the question really goes to what's, what's the probability that might happen and is it possible that other states might also um, be exempted? Well, I watched a bit of that testimony, but I didn't recall seeing that, uh, so I can't really comment on that one. Uh, yeah, this is Alex. I, I did see in the news this morning, so I apologize to the commenter for not being, you know, as uh, up to date as they are. Um, I, I think that maybe what we're hearing is that um, the agency, you know, took a very strong approach across the country, and and they have received some pretty compelling comments from states about um, feasibility, and um, and so it, that may reflect a willingness to um, think more carefully about the impacts on particular states, but. But I don't know if I see a, a, a widespread um, flurry of exemptions. So we had a, another uh, question just came in that, that I think is relevant to the multi-state agreements. Um, uh, Majority Leader McConnell indicating that uh, multi-state plans may be subject to congressional approval. Um, what was the uh, feeling, I guess, of out of you, Alex, and, and John, on that statement. And he may be referring to state compacts in particular, I'm, I'm guessing, but um, 
uh, if you had some insight into that, that would be helpful for our uh, listeners. Alex, yeah, I'll, I'll give you first shot if, if you want to take yeah, it. Yeah, yes. So, um, Glenn, let me just make sure I understand the question. It was on, on, on Senator McConnell's sort of just say no approach or something more. I thought there was a nuance there that I may have missed. Yeah, it was related to the multi, if there was a multi-state agreement that that would require congressional approval, multi-state uh, oh. uh, approaches. Yeah, yeah. so that, that came up in Reggie um, because interstate compacts do require approval under the Constitution. Um, the Reggie states did find a way to have their um, agreements recognized. Also, there, there's an interstate compact involving the Great Lakes states. Um, and so um, I would have to, to double check, but, but it's certainly been um, dealt with before. Great. In, in a way that didn't stop the, the, um, the multi-state uh, action. But, but the senator could very well be right that there's, there's some approval needed. I think it also depends yeah. on the design. And, and um, we have another question here regarding uh, current state planning, such as uh, California and, and the Reggie states and such, and those that have taken a more aggressive approach, how that will fit in with uh, EPA regulations, or will that be a challenge uh, for those states to integrate their plans with uh, EPA's requirements? Well, I, uh, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear from the preamble of the rule that EPA intends to uh, at least strongly consider approving uh, uh, programs like that. I, I think that's really clear, and, and certainly that shouldn't be surprising to anybody, uh, considering California program as well as the Reggie states are well established at this point, and you know, purportedly, you know achieve the the goal of reducing carbon emissions. So I, I think EPA certainly will strongly consider those. Great. And we have, we have time just for one more question. We're going over a little bit, but uh, we want to thank our audience for hanging on a little bit. I think it's a, it's a pretty uh, uh, complicated uh, discussion, so I think it does uh, warrant a little more time as well. Um, this question really goes to the, the point of enforcement and in, in, I guess jo John what and Alex, but, but John first, what your feelings are on uh, what EPA will uh, approve as enforceable in a plan and what type of, um, uh, whether it be legislation or, or some sort of uh, a law within the state uh, that will uh, be considered uh, to have the teeth that EPA would consider it to be uh, um, to, to meet their requirements. Yeah. Well, enforceability is obviously the big ultimate issue in approvable in approving a plan by EPA. Uh, you know, you've got those other aspects of quantifiable, uh, verifiable, permanent, uh, and these are these are issues that we've always dealt with on the state implementation side of things under Section 110, and you're your criteria pollutants like SO2 and NOx and PM and ozone. Uh, it's and under 111, it's not a SIP. It's not a state implementation plan, but it's SIP-like in terms of those aspects. And EPA expects there to be uh, an enforceability measure in there that not only is accountable that holds the state accountable, but if the state falters, then they can come in and enforce the plan themselves. So they will be looking for those mechanisms. Now, my personal wish and hope is that considering the innovativeness, to use Alex's word in her presentation, of this rulemaking, that they will be also innovative in their thinking about enforceability, and that they don't get stuck on the traditional enforceability mechanisms that we've seen on the SIP side of things. Uh, certainly, I, I think it goes without question that EPA is going to expect 
statutory and or regulatory mechanisms from the state to um, memorialize that enforceability. Uh, to what extent, you know, that can be creative, I, I, that's where I hope EPA will have a little broader thinking than they, they have in the past. And, and they should because if they truly want to give flexibility to the states, then they have to be flexible in that, that arena as well. Uh, they can't simply ignore the fact that uh, there, there's probably several ways to skin this cat and hopefully they'll, they'll recognize that. Yeah, and this is Alex. I, I would absolutely agree. I think that this is uh, a different approach and the agency has emphasized flexibility. The state does not have to do the four building blocks. The state can do a variety of other things. So the agency is going to be faced with plans that contain elements that they may not have um, predicted and, um, and some very uh, unique elements. I think the agency is going to have to take a, a very flexible um, approach to the concept of enforceability. I also wonder if just the fact that th this is to be done by 2030 plays into enforceability a bit, which is, you know, when do we have to determine that something is enforceable? Does it have to be enforceable uh, on paper as a concept? Does it have to be enforceable in terms of the result? I, I think it's really the the result, and so my my question I don't necessarily have the answer to is exactly when will the enforceability issue um, really start to to become um, big? Is it going to be when the plans are first submitted, or is it going to be um, down the road as the plans are being implemented? Yeah, and I would add that's a hugely important uh, point that Alex just made. We're expected to submit a plan in 2016 that has a compliance date in 2030. The world is going to change tremendously. Energy landscapes are going to change tremendously. Uh, that's why here in this state we're looking at uh, utilities integrated resource planning. You know, we know there's going to be other plants that shut down that we currently don't, you know, uh, have an idea about but just the age of our plants alone are going to dictate from a business decision standpoint that we're going to have plants shut down in 2025, 2026, whatever it might be. And that's more CO2 emissions reductions that we can't really verify or commit to at this point. So how do we incorporate those business decisions down the road? And you know, I think this is where EPA has really, really got to, to think more broadly. Well, great. With that, we great. will. Uh, oh, did you have another uh, comment, Alex? I was going to say it's a really great question from the from the the commenter. Great. Well, yeah, and and again, thanks so much to uh, Alex and John for participating in the webinar. Uh, it's a very complex issue, and I think they uh, were able to at least uh, uh, clear the waters a bit. Um, there's a lot of um, potential, I guess, risk here, but also um, still a lot of uncertainty about what may actually appear in the final rule. But I think um, um, this was a really great uh, opportunity to, to hear from some experts that are thinking uh, quite a bit about uh, the possibilities. Um, and I wanted to add again, we, we will be sending out the uh, link to the webinar along with a couple of uh, resources, links to resources that we mentioned here today. And we also welcome uh, attendees if they have questions to, to email us and, and follow up. Uh, and we're happy to help them out and also put them in contact with the speakers if, if, uh, if they'd like that as well. Um, and uh, again, we'll be sending that email out within the next day or two to notify you of these uh, resources. Uh, we'll also wanted to remind you we will have upcoming webinars uh, in the Natural Resources and Infrastructure uh, Committee Spring Series, uh, including a webinar tomorrow called Pilots, Planes, and Positives, General Aviation's Effects Across the Economy. Again, you can register for that at the NZSL website. Uh, thanks uh, again for joining us, and we hope you will be attending our uh, next webinar along with other future energy-related uh, and NRI-related webinars. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.